Good morning. Please be seated. Welcome to everyone here today and a special welcome to any visitors with us this week. Uh, just one quick reminder about the tea service this afternoon. It starts at four o'clock in the hall upstairs and everyone will be very welcome. And now I'd like to welcome Reverend David Chawner, who's leading our worship today. David is a retired Baptist minister and is visiting us from Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. So welcome, David, and thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. That's a nice, a nice response. I like that. I'll do it again. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Excellent. It's good to be with you. I come with an apology, not for being here, but the fact um, that uh, I think at least twice previously, I was supposed to be here, 
uh, preaching and over the years. I'm going back a few years now. And each time at the last minute, I couldn't make it for various reasons, either I was ill or something. So it's good to make it at last. And thank you for your patience with me. Um, you may be, by the time we finish, you may be thinking that was good, wasn't it? Didn't come before. Um, but um, it's good to be here. And welcome also, I understand, looking around for the camera. Is it in front of me there? Those who are watching on Zoom or, or plugging in on Zoom, welcome to you as well at home. Hope you're nice and warm. And um, on this... Uh, First Sunday in Advent, when we start to think of Christmas. I don't know about you. I mean, it starts to, I start to think of Christmas. I start to feel colder. It's something psychological about it, isn't it? We just think of all the snow and everything else. But um, we're here today in the warmth of God's love. We're here to celebrate and to rejoice in his goodness. All he's done in his world and in our lives. And above all, of course, through Jesus, whose birth we are now preparing to celebrate and who came to give his life for us, but to be raised again and open the way to eternal life for all. What a great thing to celebrate. So let's do that. We're going to be singing to God with the glory, great things he has done. The psalmist says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Let's do that very thing. Let's stand and sing. To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Oh, A pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And greater rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but pure. And greater will be our wonder, our rapture, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. 
Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Please be seated. I'm tempted to say, and all God's people said, Amen. You want to say it? And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Let's pray together. Let's come to other, let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. We come before you this morning as a congregation of your people, your sons and daughters, those who have come to know you through Jesus. We come to worship and to praise you as Almighty God, creator and sustainer of the universe, whose acts of power have been seen through the ages, the one who is all-knowing, the one who is all-powerful. And we stand in awe and view of your majesty and your might. And we come before you also as our Heavenly Father, having known your love, your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness through Jesus, your Son. And it's in his name that we bring our praise and worship this morning. As we begin the, the preparations for Christmas to celebrate his birth, we remember that he just didn't just come as a baby, but he grew up as a man. He taught us your ways. He gave his life for us on the cross offering us the forgiveness of our sins and then rose again from the dead, conquering the grave, victorious forever. And he's now ascended as in heaven, praying for us even now. And one day he will return. You are indeed worthy of all our praise and our worship, all our adoration, and the best we can give is not adequate to give you the praise and glory and honour that is due to your name. We simply come before you and ask that you will accept what we bring this morning. That you will forgive us for the things, even in this past week, where we've wandered away from your ways. That you'll renew and cleanse us again. And you build, you build us up in faith and hope in you, knowing indeed that we are yours and that you, our Heavenly Father, are the Almighty One. We simply offer ourselves this morning to you for your glory. And may your name be honoured in this place. Speak to us as you choose, Lord. Challenge us, encourage us. Whatever it is you have for us, we offer ourselves to you. And we say, come in the Holy Spirit and minister to us. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen. Now I'm told that, um, well, I know you like a talk at this point, so I'm going to come down because we've got the candles. Here we are. It's the first Sunday in Advent. And um, just in case anybody's thinking, I, I find almost every year somebody says Christmas seems to have come quickly this year. Well, just let me give you a warning. Next year, it's on the 25th of December. OK, just uh, put it in your diaries and then you won't be caught up. But it, it just seems to creep up on us every year. And four weeks today, four weeks today is Christmas Day. When I was younger, and that's a good few years ago, uh, some of you remember the local paper also used to print the number of shopping days to Christmas. Remember that? But um, we used to get that because, of course, Sunday wasn't a shopping day then, was it? So it was a question of limited. Now you've got four weeks. You've got 28 days. What you've not bought by then, it's not going to matter anyway, is it, actually? We get so I once remember talking to a neighbour of ours in London. He lived across the road from us. And he was an Orthodox Jewish guy. And we, we met on the tube coming out. We were both he lectured at a college in London. I'd been in for a meeting. And we were coming out on the tube we were talking and he was saying he was coming up to Passover and he was complaining he was complaining about the way that so many of his friends Jewish friends were stockpiling stuff for, for Passover 
and he was saying, you know, it's only a day or two, uh, but you'd think we were going to have a siege. And I thought it's just so right we are for Christmas, isn't it? You get all this stuff in as if as if there's going to be years of it, and it's just a few days. But it's coming, it's on the way, and this is the first Sunday in Advent. Now, has anybody got an Advent calendar, or you like candles at home? Anybody do that? Yeah, that's good. Well, I've I've got Advent stuff. I've got an Advent bar. I know you're all jealous now, aren't you? I didn't bring this in, so I kind of have a bit of chocolate during the sermon or anything like that. But feel free if you've got any. I won't, won't trouble me at all. My daughter gave me this. It's um, Well, there are other bars available, I assume, but I don't know whether anybody else but Cadbury's does an Advent bar. Uh, and it's got little, there's little bits, so you have a bit each day. The problem I've got with it is, and they're numbered 1 to 20, I think it goes to 24, does it? Yeah. And um, I don't know till I open it. I've got a problem, though, with this. I don't know which end to open it, which, whether one's at that end or whether one's at that end. Anybody want to make a guess? I mean, if you, you guess is good. Sorry? Top left. Top left. You're, have you opened yours already? <laughs> you're writing top left. But, but what if that's 24 or 23 or something? It's very confusing. So I've got, it got broken, I think, when she brought it. She lives in London. She brought it up. Um, so it's... Do we start at the end or do we start at the beginning? And that's an interesting question for the first Sunday in Advent, because traditionally we start at the end. Did you know that? Advent starts at the end. In other words, the traditional topic for uh, first Sunday in Advent is Jesus' return, the second coming. So it starts at the end. We look forward to the end and come back to the beginning. I think that's great because you can you can see the whole story. You see, this bar is a whole. I'll eat it in bits, one bit a day. I'm looking forward to Wednesday, no, Thursday, isn't it, the first, when I can start into it. And you can start your advent calendars and everything. But I can nibble a bit of chocolate, whether I'll do it in the morning or the afternoon. So many decisions I'm going to make, or the afternoon or the evening. But I'll get there. I'll get there eventually. And... Um, but it's, although it's 1 to 24, it's actually a whole bar. That's the whole story. And I think one of the things about the first Sunday in Advent, remember Jesus' return, is that that is the whole story. The story of what God's doing for his world and done for his world is not complete yet. Sometimes we give the impression that it finished at the resurrection or the ascension of Jesus. It didn't. There's more to come. In the words of... Um, Al Jolson, wasn't it? You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. That glory. We're going to be thinking about it later. That glorious day when Jesus returns as a new heaven, a new earth. And that's what we celebrate today. And I want you to get excited about it because I think it's the most exciting prospect that this world can possibly know. A new heaven and a new earth. So we're going to light the Advent candle. And I think I've got to help us. Where is she? I, yeah, I have to apologise this morning because I'm not seeing terribly well simply because I had a cataract operation four weeks ago, and this eye isn't operating very well. So we're going to light this one, then we're going to sing Hail to the Lord's Anointed, which is um, a traditional Advent hymn. So we'll get it going. It worked before. You know, you just press that and get a flame, and then light one of the red ones at the front. That's it. You've got it now, I think. Excellent. Well done. How about a round of applause? <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. Let's stand and sing Hail to the Lord's Anointed, Great David's Greater Son. <laughs> Anointed, great David's greater song. Hail in the time appointed, his reign on earth begun. He comes to break oppression, to set the captive free. Take away transgression. 
nation and rule in equity. He comes with succor speedy to those who suffer wrong, to help the poor and needy, and bid the weak be strong, to give them songs for sighing, the darkness turn to light, to souls condemned and dying were precious in his sight. He shall come down like showers upon the fruitful earth. Love, joy, and hope like flowers spring in path to birth before him on the mountains shall peace the herald go and righteousness in fountains from hell to valley shall fall down before him and gold and incense bring all nations shall adore him his praise all people sing to him shall prayer unceasing and daily Ascend. His kingdom still increasing, a kingdom without end. For every foe victorious, he on his throne shall rest. From age to age more glorious, all blessing and all blessed. The tide of time shall never his covenant remove. His name shall stand forever. His changeless name of love. Please be seated. We come to our time of prayer for the world, call it our intercessions, but it's really what it means is simply bringing to God the needs of the world, our own needs, and uh, what the things we want to talk over with him. So let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, even as we celebrate who you are and what you've done, as we celebrate the, the amazing story of Jesus and the salvation he brings and the hope that he brings, we're only too conscious that even 2,000 years further down the line, we've not learned the lesson so often. The lesson you came to teach us of your ways, your way of compassion and love and grace and mercy. And we ask your forgiveness for ourselves and on behalf of the whole human race that we have so ignored you we so put you aside and we come to plead for your mercy upon us, Lord, as a world, the world in which we live, which tears itself apart with bitterness and hatred, conflict and war, 
You think especially, of course, of the conflict in the Ukraine. There's so many places around the world where men and women are killing each other, sometimes even in the name of religion. Scripture says that you make wars to cease to the ends of the earth and how we long for that day. And so we pray that that peace on earth that the angels proclaimed will be seen active in this world even today. Bring reconciliation. Be with those who attempt to make peace, Lord. Blessed are the peacemakers and may they really be blessed by you those who earnestly and sincerely seek to bring reconciliation. Some of these issues, we don't see the ways through, Lord. We see them as intractable, but with you, nothing is impossible. And so we ask that you will move in power and bring more of your peace on this earth. We pray for our own nation. And we seem to be so divided, Lord in so many ways, the issues that we face, cost of living, the attitudes towards each other. Daily we hear of racism and all sorts of other things that divide us. We pray for a huge movement of your Holy Spirit across this land. Bring us back into our right mind, Lord, like the prodigal. May we come to our senses by your spirits working in us and realize what we're doing to each other and to the society that you've created for us. We pray for our leaders. Give them wisdom, Lord. Whatever our political standing, we pray, we pray for them that they'll be able to find a way through the mess that we're in. And that it will be one that is just and right and blesses everybody. We thank you for all those who are working to relieve poverty and help those in need. May we be a society that's full of compassion, Lord, your compassion flowing out of your love for us in Jesus. And as we pray for our society and our nation, we pray for your church. We thank you that although there is darkness and has been for 2,000 years, that light that was lit in the coming of Jesus has shined in the darkness and the darkness has never and never will be able to overcome it. We thank you that the church stands still firm. Oh, yes, Lord, we may feel that we're weak. Help us not to look at our own strength, but on your strength, your resources. Give us the courage to stand for what is right. We thank you for the way that your church in this country is so engaged in things like food banks and other ways to reach out to people, debt, helping them come through the, the challenges of life. And we pray your blessings on all those efforts. But above all, we pray that as we proclaim the name and the love of Jesus, that that will wing home into people's hearts and minds. And we'll see a mighty move of your spirit bringing revival in this land. Strengthen your church, we pray, Lord. As we pray for the church, we realize that's us individually. Help us to stand firmly for you, to live and to follow your ways. That we may indeed be your witnesses. Not just in word, but in the whole of our lives. That you'll be able to work through us and touch the lives of others with that love and compassion of the Father in every situation. So we thank you, Lord, offering ourselves to you and with you, with ourselves, we bring all our resources, the gifts given today and those given monthly, gifts of money, gifts of time and talents. We bring them all to you and pray that you'll take them and as you took those loaves and fishes, Lord, it seemed so meager compared to the, the challenge before us. And what we can offer seems so, before that group, to feed 5,000, it seems so little. And what we can offer seems so little in front of the challenges before us. But we know, again, you can do that which with us is impossible. 
So take what we offer, we pray. Use it mightily. And may your name resound again, clearly and visibly through this place. Take us and use us to that end, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're coming to our scripture reading, and Bob's going to come and give that to us in a minute. But uh, I want to introduce it first because it's from a very difficult, well, it's from the he book of Hebrews, or the letter to the Hebrews. And the letter to the Hebrews is one which isn't always easy to understand. And I have to confess, I'd chosen this reading, and there was a bit in it, I thought, where does he get that from? And it was only when we were going through our uh, house group material this week, and I confess I write the house group material as well, so I should have seen this before and looked it up. And we were looking at Genesis chapter 22, which is the story of Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice, well, Abraham being asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. And in this reading, it talks about God making a promise, but um, swearing an oath on himself. You'll, you'll hear the reading. And uh, by, by himself, because there's no one greater to swear by, as it were, because it says people take an oath by someone, something that's greater than them. God does it to himself, by himself. And that's in Genesis 22. After Abraham has not, has, you know, they find the ram and he doesn't have to slaughter Isaac, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, God says to him, because you've been faithful, I swear by myself that your descendants will be as numerous and, you know, as stars in heaven. And also that through him, through those uh, descendants, all nations on the earth will be blessed. And it's one of the early references to the way that, that God's love and compassion and, and his presence is not just for the people of, of Israel who he's called to be his witnesses at that point, but right through and it, it, going to all the nations means those non who are non-Hebraic Hebraic, are out into the Gentile world as well. So it's talking about Jesus. That's what this is about. And um, we'll hear in this that um, it brings us towards Jesus. So just to put it in that perspective, uh, we any Jewish person listening to this would have known straight away what he was talking about. We're not as well versed or, or often. Some of you probably are, but not all of us in the Old Testament scriptures. So just a little bit of explanation of where this comes from and the story he's talking about. And Bob's going to read now Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and put an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. Amen. Thanks, Bob. I don't know how many of you are here were in the boys' brigade. Many, yeah. Um, but uh, that obviously is also the, the passage from which we get the sure and steadfast motto in the authorised version, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. <clears throat> I was tempted to use that hymn, but I'm going to use a different one now. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. It refers to the anchor. Let's stand and sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. And my hope is built on
Please be seated. I expect and um, assume that a lot of us have watched Dad's Army. I watched it last night purely by chance. I sat down, I thought I'm going to relax for a little while, put the telly on, flick through, and then on BBC Two was yet another episode of Dad's Army. There's only a limited number of episodes, but it all seems to be whenever I watch it, have I seen this one before? Don't know, you know. But one of the things that sad Dad's Army is, well, it's always funny. Even if you've seen it before, you know what's coming. It, it's it's very well done. But um, there are lots of catchphrases in Dad's Army, uh, one of which is, you know, you stupid boy when he says to the young guy, and another one is uh, um, don't panic, don't panic. That's, uh, uh, this sergeant, kind of what his name now, runs around, doesn't he? Uh, in this mad panic state, but the other one is is corporal is it's, um, Private Fraser, and he's when he says in that Scottish accent, "We're doomed, we're doomed," and indeed it did feel like that to many people at the problem. I don't know if it was majority, but a good number of people in the U in Britain at that time, when they were expecting the German invasion, were doomed. And I wonder whether there's quite a few people feel that way at the moment. As we look at the world, issues like climate change, war in Ukraine with that hideous worry of nuclear warfare hanging in the background. As we look at our own country, the cost of living, as so we've prayed about the divisions that we have, is there any way forward? Or are we doomed? Some would say that when they look at the church in this country and see the falling numbers and where's it all going? Are we doomed? We're desperately certainly looking for some sort of hope. And it was a bit that way, or it was a lot that way, in Israel immediately before the birth of Jesus. Roman occupation. There seemed to be no hope of getting back to that great kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of David and Solomon and those times when Israel was a great nation. No, it seemed that the whole nation was doomed. There were divisions. There were those who were trying to rebel against the Romans. Nothing succeeded. There seemed no way out. They were under oppression. But deep down, they were waiting for God to do something because they had this belief that God was going to act. He was going to deliver them. He was going to bring a savior to bring them hope. And that's where they pinned their hope. And today, we prepare ourselves to celebrate the reality of the coming of that hope in Jesus. His birth, his life, his death and resurrection. But for them at that time, it wasn't like that at all. And in fact, when Jesus came, it wasn't what they had hoped for. It would seem, as far as we can see, that what they were looking for was a military and political leader to restore the nation as a political entity, to get rid of the Romans. I have to say that Christmas sometimes for many people is going to be something 
you know, what we're hoping for to get next Christmas in four weeks' time may not be what actually arrives. But the exciting thing is that the reality of what came in Jesus was something greater, more far-reaching, with great, far wider scope than anything anybody could have imagined at the time. Although the hints were there in the Old Testament, they were looking from a narrow perspective. This hope that came in Jesus was wider and broader than anything anybody could have imagined. And that hope is still here for you and me today. We may have our hopes for Christmas. We may have our hopes for our society. But the hope that Jesus things brings is far bigger than anything that we can imagine or could have imagined. And the writer of Hebrews encourages his readers and us today to take hold of the hope set before us. I love that. Take hold of the hope set before us. Whatever's happening, all the things that are happening in our world and our country and every and in our lives, he says, whatever's happening, take hold of the hope set before you. An anchor in times of trouble, fixed and firm in the reality of Jesus and all that he's done. What we're going to do this morning is take a look at the true nature of that hope. Firstly, it's a hope for the past. A hope for the past. So many people, maybe some here today, define themselves by the past. What do I mean by that? It may be guilt for something we've done in the past. It may be shame for something we didn't do in the past. It may be regrets for opportunities we missed in the past. It may be a sense of failure that we failed someone, even God, in the past. And it haunts and it hounds us, holding us back and dragging us down. And whatever we do, it's always there. It may drive us onward to try and make some sort of amends for it. We may try and escape from it by going into good things or whatever and doing things, but it's always there within us, niggling away at the back of the mind, the past. There's a poem, some of you will know it, and uh, it's called The Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And there's wonderful four lines in that, which says, the moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. When that past is niggling at us, when it's mocking us, and actually when the devil himself is sometimes saying, just look what you are, look what you are. There's nothing we can do to wipe that slate clean, and we know it. We can't deny the reality, but it's there. But there is hope for the past. That is the good news of Jesus. There is complete, total forgiveness through his death on the cross. Doesn't God say your sins and iniquities I will remember no more? Done. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow, totally washed. And then in the New Testament, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin. But it goes further than that. And make us clean from all unrighteousness. The whole thing is what the slate is wiped clean and it's done through the death of Jesus. Now we know that. We've heard it so often. But we need to get it into our minds that the, the cross, all sin has been dealt with. And the resurrection of Jesus proves it. He's conquered sin as well as death. Because death is the consequence of sin. It's a complete package, as it were. When Jesus cries on the cross, it is finished. It's the word he uses is what's written over a bill that's paid. It's finished. It's paid. The price is paid. It's the same word they used. And that's what he's doing across all our past, all the we owe God, all the guilt and the shame, the failure, it's, it's dealt with in the cross of Christ. 
And what's more, that brings reconciliation between us and God so that we know him as our father. We become his children. The past is dealt with. There is hope for your past and my past. And I wonder if sometimes for those of us who've been long in the faith, that we begin to take this for granted. We forget what it was like in that world into which Jesus was born. There was no absolute assurance of God's forgiveness, or there were sacrifices. And on the Day of Atonement, the high priest went into the, the Holy of Holies where they believed God lived. And in there, he offered a sacrifice for the whole sin of the whole nation. And they waited with expectation to see if God would accept that or not. There was no absolute guarantee. So much so that they had a problem. That if the high priest went in there and God didn't accept it, he would be struck down. And if that was the case, how did they get his body out? So they would tie a rope around his leg. So that if he went in there through that curtain, and that's, that's what we talk about, the veil here in, in Hebrews is talking about the curtain be, that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. So that if the, anything happened to the priest, the high priest in there during that time, they could pull his body out. There was no absolute assurance that this sacrifice would work. In Jesus, there is an absolute assurance that his sacrifice has worked and is the forgiveness of our sins. There is hope for the past. And what's more, it's not just a hope for what we've done but, and the forgiveness before God, but there's hope of healing of the hurts and the scars of the past as well. The scars and the hurts that people have done to us. As it say, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Not that there are no consequences, but it's that the fact the past doesn't have to define us or hold us back, and there is healing there for it as well. In Jesus, we have the offer of the freedom from the past. What a hope, hope to hold on to. Let us hold on to that hope in Jesus. Secondly, this hope is a hope in the present. It's all well and good, you say, to talk about the past, but I have to live in the here and now. So do we all. And that can seem to become increasingly difficult. We all know the practicalities and the difficulties we're facing. But also as followers of Jesus, it's never easy, is it? I love the, um, oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. You know, it says the, the, the tempting sights. Yeah, the, the, I see the sights that dazzle, the tempting sounds I hear. So many things that can draw us away from living completely in Jesus' way. But also it can be that standing, just standing up for our faith these days can be difficult. Not always, but it can be. You know, the amazing thing is that Jesus knew that we were going to face these things. The end of John chapter 16 and the end of his um, speech, what we call the, the, these discourses, the 14, 15, 16 chapters of John's gospel, where Jesus is talking to his disciples and getting his message over to them the night before he dies. And he says, in the world, you will have trouble. Didn't have to tell us that, but he's saying, I know that. This is what it's going to be like, guys. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And then, of course, before he leaves, he says, and I am with you always. Again, the beginning of in, in Hebrews chapter 13, it says, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He's promised his presence right through life, whatever we face. And that, of course, is that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because of Jesus' life and death and re resurrection, we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, a guide, a comforter, a helper, walking with us day by day, all the resources. He is God. Part of the Trinity, all the resources of the Godhead poured into our lives, you and me. As it says in Scripture, everything we need for life and godliness, God has provided. Not just a new start either, but the same old people. It's a new person, a rebuilding of our lives in Jesus' way. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a text we often hear quoted god says i know the plans i have for you plans to give you hope plans to give you hope here in this life we have hope 
What a hope that you and I can become more and more like Jesus. More and more reflective of God's life and love and attitudes. Rather than being conformed to the attitudes and ways that surround us, we become transformed step by step into the person God made you to be and made me to be. Not a remodeling of the past, a few changes, a few tweaks here and there, but something genuinely new, that new creation. Of course, it's not yet finished. It's the old saying, isn't it? Be patient with me. God's not finished with me yet. But like the Apostle Paul, we press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of us. There's a future in this life ahead of us. There's hope in the present in this life. It applies to our society as well. How society has changed since Jesus came. The things that we do and take for granted, many things in, our, in, in the way we live, come from this good news of Jesus. We've seen it in our own society in the way that caring for the, the poor, um, education, all those things came out of the Christian church. Because it didn't, well, not the church that created them, it's because God cared for individuals and people, that personal care that we see in Jesus, that love that he brings. He so loves the world and he shows it through his people. And it transforms society. The compassion and grace of Jesus. I'm involved in sports chaplaincy and um, up until last year was chair of sports chaplaincy UK. And we have this dream to see an expression of God's love and compassion in every community of sport. It's amazing size of a dream because it's massive. But it's seeing God's love and compassion. And that's what he's doing through us. He's working in society. There is hope for society in the present as we see the changes happen, yeah, that's not finished yet. I and mean, it probably never will be, but we see the kingdom of God growing. We've already sung about that. Through Jesus, there is the prospect of being the people God made us to be and seeing something of the society God intends us to be. What a hope, hope to hold on to. Let us hold firmly to the hope. And then thirdly, it's a hope that takes us into the future. By the very nature of being a minister, most of the funerals that I'm involved in or go to are Christian funerals. So I suddenly discovered one day that I thought occurred to me I'd never been to anything other than even vaguely Christian funeral. And I was going to a, a funeral at, um, it was actually at Mortlake Crematorium, and I got there early. I like to get to funerals early because there's nothing worse than rushing up at the last minute or can't miss it the fear was we had two we had two crematoria in london we had it wasn't no that this was at breakspear it was breakspear and mortlake and i did know one of the other local ministers baptist ministers who once turned up at the wrong one which was a bit scary because you don't get two chances on that and they were quite a distance apart so i was always getting there early and i got there early for this one and the previous funeral was just going in as i arrived and I went into the office and it was all relayed into the office where, where you left your things and your coats and stuff. So I watched this funeral and it was a humanist funeral. So I was even more fascinated. I thought, this is great. I'm going to see this. And one thing I admired about the person who was the celebrant was she started off by saying, this is a humanist funeral. We don't believe there is anything after this life. And I thought, good on you. You're being honest about this and straightforward. I went to another one that recently it was a, funeral of a relative um, and it purported to be humanist and it was talking about some vague afterlife and spirits floating around and I don't know where he got it from but that's the problem you see it takes a great deal of faith I have my people who can believe there's nothing after this life because there's a general feeling around isn't there, there must be something more than this is this all there is and yet how people see that is 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 strange I remember one guy talking about how he saw heaven and there was various steps to it and all this sort of thing. And it was based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. You see, what people are looking for is a hope that there's something more than this. There's a feeling within us there must be. But what do they base it on? In Christ alone, my hope is found 
I love the fact that at a funeral, the Queen had, um, all my hope on God is founded. What a statement of faith. See, our hope is in Jesus. And because of his life and death and resurrection, it doesn't just stop there. He's entered in through the veil, as it says in Hebrews, through that curtain into the very presence of God, not in the temple, but in heaven. And he's there praying for us. He's preparing a heavenly home for us, preparing a place even now for you and for me. And I'm inclined to believe him. Why? Now, if somebody came to me and said, they're going to kill me. I can see that happening. I can't get out of this. But three days later, I'll come back to life. I wouldn't believe him, to be honest. <laughs> it would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Fantastical. And yet, Jesus said that, but it happened. And if somebody said that to me and it happened three days later, I would start to take seriously everything they said. You need to take Jesus seriously. We don't know what that home in heaven will be like but it will be with him. He says, I'm coming to take you to myself. A relationship of love from which nothing can ever separate us, says scripture. Walking with him into the future. That assurance of eternal life. What a hope. I know some of you here uh, knew Ivan Brown, who died recently. Another person from Mount Pleasant who I knew well died earlier than the year. And both of them talking to the one I didn't, somebody else who was talking to Ivan, but this other person I was speaking to her on the phone, she knew she was terminally ill. Ivan knew he was dying. Said, we're at peace. We're at peace. My own wife died five years ago. She was at peace. Saying, God is good. God is good. What a reassurance. When brothers and sisters face that and say, no, it's okay. It's okay. God's with me. A relationship of love from which nothing can separate us. The assurance of eternal life. What a hope. But folks, we ain't seen nothing yet. That's not the half of it. There's something even more glorious lying down the line. The return of Jesus, which we celebrate today. And what a day that will be. Those last two chapters of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And then he, John is shown the new Jerusalem. He says it shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. Didn't see a temple because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's no need of light for they are its lamp. And there's a river flowing down the middle and there is life and all the wealth of the nations comes into it, all the glory of the nations. And there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Now, whatever catastrophes may or may not come, I don't know. Climate change may mean the end of this planet. It may not. Nuclear war may mean the end of this planet. It may not. Who knows? Jesus says those things will happen. Not those things specifically, but there'll be wars, rumors of wars. There'll be all sorts of turmoil. He didn't hide that reality from us. But one thing is certain. The final climax of history is in God's hands. And it will happen. It's the, the whole, it completes the picture. Jesus didn't know when it was going to happen. None of us can predict it, but we can wait upon it and work today in the confidence of it. And one day we will stand with him through faith in Jesus in that glorious place. There's a song that came out of, um, was written just about a year ago now, out of uh, the whole 
COVID pandemic. And it's a response to that, looking forward, whatever's happening, looking forward to that glory of heaven and Jesus' return. It's called the hymn of heaven. We're going to watch it now and listen to it. There is a line where they get the words wrong. Um, so don't, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see it anyway, but you can hear the, the words on that line. Um, but the words are on the, on the screen as well. So let's watch and listen to this and get excited about what's going to happen when Jesus returns. Have I lost sleeping every heaven What pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity to our God but you may say why doesn't that just happen now why doesn't Jesus return now get it over with 
course, Scripture tells us that God wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants to offer everybody the opportunity. It's our job to get out there and tell them that there is hope. But in Jesus, there is the promise, not just of life in this life, but being part of everything being made new. What a hope, hope to hold on to. Earlier on in Hebrews, the writer says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And that hope is there for all to live in, you and me and everybody here this morning and the people we meet during the week. The message is there's no need to stumble around in darkness and despair. Sometimes I walk into a room and I think I know what's on the other side of the room, so I don't need at night, I don't need to turn the light on, but often there's things that I trip over. So what do I do? I put the light on. It's as simple as that. We put our faith in Jesus. We accept him as our saviour and our Lord. We let him deal with the past. We accept his presence in the, in the, current, in, in the present. And we trust him for the future. Simply a matter of taking hold of it by faith. You've never done that before. Do it now. And through which, as the writer to Hebrews says, you'll be greatly encouraged. And hold on to it, whatever's happening. That is our faith. Is it a psychological trick? No. Because he who promised is faithful. And just as he was faithful to his promise to Abraham and his descendants have now blessed the world through Jesus, of which you and I are the beneficiaries today. So he carries on. We're not doomed. We're not doomed. God is at work in the past, present and the future. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Why live in the darkness of gloom and doom when we can live in the blazing light of hope in Jesus? Whatever you're hoping for this Christmas, I hope that Santa's good to you and he'll bring it. But may you know most of all, and my prayer for each one of us this Christmas, that we know the fullness of the hope that Jesus brings of a certainty. But we have this hope. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary where Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. May that inspire us as we come to celebrate Christmas and indeed all the days of our life. Hold on to the hope. Hold on to the hope. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the hope you placed before us. The cleansing from the past, your presence in the here and now, the glory of a future in you in heaven and in that new heaven and new earth. Take hold of us by your spirit, I pray. Inspire us. Help us to see this Christmas time, this Advent time, the full reality of that hope, so that when we come to Christmas, our celebration of the birth of Jesus will be the richer and fuller because of it. We ask this in his mighty name. Amen. How does God make this happen? I don't know. And we're going to sing a hymn that says that. But it says, but this I do know, it will happen. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the sons of men. But this I know, he was born, he died, he rose again, and he will return. Let's stand and sing this, our final hymn. I cannot tell. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should 
set his love upon the sons of men. Oh, why as shepherd he should seek the wanderers to bring them back. I know. But this I know, that he was born of Mary, when Bethlehem's manger was his only home, and that he Savior of the world is come. I cannot tell how silently he suffered as with his peace he graced this place of tears. was broken, the crown of pain to three and thirty years. But this I know, he heals the broken hearted, and stays our sin and calms our looking fear and lifts the burden from the heavy laden for yet the Savior, Savior Satisfy the needs and aspirations of East and West, of sinner and of sage. But this I know, flesh shall see his glory. shall reap the harvest he has sown, and some glad day his sun shall shine in splendor, when he the Savior, Savior I know the 
skies will thrill with rapture and myriad myriad human voices sing and earth to heaven and heaven to earth will answer at last the Savior, Savior of the world is King. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and fill your lives to overflowing this day and forevermore. Amen.